The death of six cheetahs, three adults and three cubs at the Kuno National Park in Madhya Pradesh since March this year has resulted in serious questions being asked on whether the cheetahs are best suited for India and whether the conditions at Kuno, where they were brought with a lot of fanfare last year and released by the Prime Minister, is indeed suitable. Three of the four cubs born to the cheetah Jwala died earlier this month. Sasha, one of the translocated Namibian cheetahs, died due to a kidney-related ailment on the 27th of March, while the cheetah Uday, brought from South Africa, died on the 13th of April. There are others as well. So the question that arises, um, are these teething troubles for this program, or are there in fact long-term concerns on whether this project can succeed at all? Joining us now, Ravi Chelam, the CEO of MetaString Foundation and coordinator of the Biodiversity Collaborative in Bengaluru. Later on, we'll be joined by Dr. Anish Andheria, the president of the Wildlife Conservation Trust. But let me come across to you, Mr. Chelam, first. Do you believe that uh, the introduction of cheetahs was appropriate in India? The cheetahs don't even figure in our National Wildlife Action Plan which is the policy document guiding conservation in India. This covers the period 2017-2031. If it doesn't figure in our National Wildlife Action Plan, how does it suddenly become a priority? There are several species, Great Indian Buster, for example, which are crying for attention. I believe it is a misplaced priority. It's an expensive distraction that the country can ill afford. How would you respond to those who say that uh, there were cheetahs, they are now extinct in India, and therefore it's an attempt at, uh, at, at getting the cheetah back to India? Obviously, genetically, these cheetahs are different. Uh, but um, does, do, is that not what the goal... It, it, do you not believe that that is a viable goal? That's a laudable goal. Is it number one, number 10, number 100, or number 1,000 in your priority is what needs to be decided. Great Indian Bustards number less than 150 in this country. There has been one single cause for its death, overhead power lines. The Supreme Court ordered the burying of the power lines. Nothing has happened. Even diverters haven't been put. The government says it doesn't have money to do it. Where do we find and how do we find the money for the cheetahs? Is this just uh, restricted to money? Because in the case of Cheetah, which is a high-profile sort of venture, money doesn't seem to be the problem. But as I understand it, it's the suitability of Kudo National Park, which is one of the big problems. Is that right? India is not ready to have cheetahs. Cheetahs are wide-ranging, low-density species. On an average, in the best of habitats, they occur in less than one per hundred square kilometers. Lions, tigers, leopards all occur 10, 15, 20 to 100 square kilometers. So for cheetahs, you need four, five, six thousand square kilometers of habitat. Do we have it? We don't. So it is not so much about Kuno being unsuitable, it's about India being unsuitable. The other concern which was raised was, of course, temperatures. Uh, a lot of those cubs, uh, three of them, I think, died. And one of the reasons given is the temperatures were uncharacteristically high. But as I understand it, temperatures in Madhya Pradesh in these regions go up to 50 degrees centigrade. And therefore, is this animal on the grounds of temperature alone suitable for India? Temperature is a red herring. Cheetahs live in deserts. They are used to cold as well as hot temperatures. And in this case, the mating took place in captivity. The managers who allowed the mating knew that April, May, June are going to be hot months. Mm -hmm. If they were so concerned about temperatures, why were the male and female allowed to mate? I mean, this is not wild cheetahs mating. These are cheetahs mating within enclosures under full 100% of your control. So temperature to me is not an issue. Temperatures are going to get hotter with climate change. So what are we going to do? Are we going to air-condition India? No, and that in fact brings me to my next question. Is Kuno uh, physically all right to uh, imbibe or incorporate cheetahs? The reason I ask that is because there is an enclosure and there is a larger space as well. Uh, I understand the larger point that you're making that cheetahs need a lot more area. But just in terms of their survival and the availability of, uh, of, of wildlife over there, is it suitable? Survival is, is a, 
I mean, births and deaths don't make or break a project. Those are in some sense the only guarantees in our life. It's the circumstances, the causes of death and the lessons we need to learn from. Unfortunately, we are still not very clear about the causes for many of the deaths. We don't have access to the post-mortem report, so we can't come to an independent judgment. Be that apart, your question is about Kuno. To me, space. Kuno can have the habitat structure, can have the prey, can have everything. But 750 square kilometers, even according to the action plan, is supposed to only accommodate 21 cheetahs. 21 cheetahs don't make a viable long-term population. Our estimates are Kuno is more likely to be able to accommodate between 7 and 10 cheetahs, not 21 cheetahs. Is it your belief that uh, the long-term survival of the 21 is very much uh, in doubt? See, again, it depends. This 21 itself, the action plan states will take 15 years. So it's not tomorrow that you're going to get the 21. So mortality has been factored into the action plan. This 21 is the established population. Today, we can't claim there to be an established population. You are having captive animals which are being released, which are being tailed 24-7. So it's a bit of a circus out there. Is it your belief that uh, the South African and Namibian experts who were an active part of this project to begin with were wrong. Uh, you know, those who are in favor of Project Cheetah would argue that there has been the best international opinion which has been sought. The international opinion has been sought. Whether it is best or not, time will prove. Because majority of the people consulted are not free-ranging cheetah ecologists. They are veterinarians, captive animal managers, they haven't really dealt with, observed, free-ranging wild cheetahs. More recently, both from Namibia and South Africa, there have been hard-hitting publications basically proving what many of us have been saying based on decades of work, based on solid data. So I wouldn't agree that the best international opinion or even national opinion has been sought. The other point which has been raised is that cheetahs do suffer up to 90%, uh, cheetah cubs suffer up to 90% mortality and therefore the death of these cheetahs in the last couple of months is uh, not unexpected. I repeat what I've said, deaths and births don't define the success or failure of a project. So it is interesting that this project has suddenly attracted attention, one when it was released and then when the deaths occurred. In between, there's really the hard questions haven't been asked. The really basic questions haven't been asked. What is the quality of the science? Is the conservation objectives appropriate? And the big lion in the room, not the elephant. Why isn't the 2013 Supreme Court judgment to translocate lions to Kuno still not implemented? How come we are in such a hurry, running like a cheetah to implement a cheetah project based on an experimental order? And the order only says on an experimental basis you can introduce African cheetahs when the 2013 Supreme Court order said in letter and spirit translocate Asiatic lines from Gir to Kuno. So to me, all of this is not about conservation. It's about continuing to stall line translocation. Do you think this was, a, this was an exercise in vanity? I've called it that and more. What would you call it? Glorified Safari Park. Is that ultimately expensive what, mistake? Would 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 you call it just that? That perhaps it is nothing more than what you've described. It's um, the possibility of of people across this country seeing a remarkable species in our forests, and that perhaps that's all that it can eventually be, at best. No, if that happens, that means the project has succeeded, right? If if you see free ranging wild cheetahs, that's the true measure of success. At what cost? How many cheetahs are we going to bring? There are now estimates of 500 to 1,000 cheetahs have to come for India to have a viable population. Is Africa going to keep giving us so many cheetahs? What about our native species? What about Great Indian Buster? What about Asiatic lion? What about our wolves? What about our floricans? What about our caracal, black bar, chinkara? I mean, just do a cost-benefit analysis of the amount of financial and other investment you're doing in our rest of species and how much this is attracting. And the action plan is not being followed. Animals were to be released within two months of, or three months after they came. They've been in prolonged captivity. If you were not ready to release them, where was the tearing hurry to get these animals? 
Is it true that uh, ultimately if these uh, animals do find a measure of success in our forests, I am not suggesting that that may not necessarily happen, that they come uh, into, into a conflict with other apex predators like the leopard? Vishnu, this is how nature works. This is called niche separation. Lions, leopards, cheetahs can live in the same landscape. It's not in the same square kilometer, but in the same hundreds of square kilometers. They have their own ecologies, but there is a pecking order. Clearly, lion is at the top, next would be the leopard, and finally the cheetah, which is why the cheetah exists, makes it so scarce. It exists in very low densities. So that is not an issue. To me, overlapping, this, and in Africa, cheetahs exist with lions and leopards. In India, they have existed with lions, leopards, and tigers. So yeah. that's, that's really not an issue. So just a final question to you, a final question or two. In your opinion, is there any benefit at all in bringing this spectacular animal to India? Is there any benefit at all? See, the benefits are all mentioned in the action plan. So it's not for me to second guess the government on this. I think these are overstated. These are grossly overstated. The cheetah is supposed to come and save our open natural ecosystems, our grasslands. I'm finding it difficult for the cheetahs to save themselves at this point of time. Forget going and saving grassland. Then timelines of 15 years, 30 years. We don't have that kind of timelines with our grasslands or our grassland dependent species like Great Indian Bustards. To me, it is an expensive distraction. I wish the project well. I don't want the project to fail. But you cannot set aside the national priorities and the Supreme Court order about translocating lines and suddenly have a foreign interloper. All right. Uh, well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chella. Very hard-hitting words over there. Your concerns uh, about Project Cheetah. Well, they are over here. And, and as you mentioned, let's hope that this project does somehow the other succeed. But it's going to be difficult going forward. Thank you very much for sharing your concerns. Thanks very much, India. Thank you. The wildlife community in India is squarely divided on this issue. Joining us now, one of the finest, Dr. Anish Andheria, president of the Wildlife Conservation Trust. Anish, good to speak to you. Um, cheetahs in India, will it work out in the long run? Um, it's not going to be easy. Uh, we need to really make sure that there is land for them. This land that we have is just 700 square kilometers and it's also not prime cheetah habitat. And in the best habitat uh, in Africa, the density of this animal is just one per hundred square kilometers. So if you don't have a land or if you don't have landscapes, which are like 3,000, 4,000 square kilometers, you will not have a stable population. Again, ecologically stable. See, you can have 100 cheetahs in a zoo. So you could have them in captivity and they will survive, they will breed. But if you want them to stabilize in the wild, like the tigers, like the leopards, like some other cats that live in the country, they will need space and that too undisturbed space with a lot of prey. So we don't have that right now. So Kuno is an initial stage. The government knows that Kuno was the first step and it's a baby step. We will be able to comment on the success of the program, I would say in about 15, 20 years. As and of now, we are far away from there. And Anish, if we are or if land is found and the open spaces that you talk about are available, is the species itself viable for survival in, in India? See, land that we need is an open land. So, for instance, you think about Africa, you think about uh, grassy areas. So, if you look at India, then in Gujarat, in Rajasthan, in parts of Madhya Pradesh, in some parts of uh, Andhra, Andhra also, you may have those landscapes. But today, it is overrun by people because obviously, we, we, you should know that in the last 100 years, 120 years, we've lost nearly 200,000 square kilometers of grassland and open lands. So grass and arid, so that typical cheetah habitat that existed about 120 years ago is now not there. See, if a tree goes, people observe and they know that something is wrong. But if you look at India, we think grasslands uh, and deserts are wastelands. So those are areas which are taken over by communities. That's where our developmental projects today, the government is planning um, huge numbers of uh, solar power plants in uh, marshlands, in deserts, because that's categorized as wasteland. So first of all, in our head, if we want this carnivore to survive, 
we have to change our psyche from top down which means we have to start respecting non forested landscapes we have to start talking to people and in this low density area say uh, areas around the desert national park near jaisalmer and all these areas we'll have to talk to the communities the communities will have to subscribe to this idea because you cannot move them and cheetahs fortunately are not like tigers or leopards there is never an attack from a cheetah on a human being but definitely if you have cheetahs they will go for your sheep and the goats livestock and so they have to accept that there will be losses because of the cheetah cheetah is always going to be in low density which means it's not going to be much they will go for livestock wherever they can get an opportunity but it's not going to be like a tiger living next to a village killing a cow every 4 days that's not going to happen and and i think if we are trying to acclimatize this grassland species why are we doing it if i were if you ask me if we are not going to be able to secure the grasslands that we, we have lost we will never be able to bring back the florican the great indian bustard the hyenas the wolves that have gone because we have destroyed the so cheetah can be used like the tiger was used as a symbol to get the forested species back and we were able to do this elephants population have gone up after the project tiger was lost similarly cheetah should act as a conduit to get all the other endangered species which are now counting days they could go extinct any moment if we really take seriously that government at the center has to back this project and work with community if we have to with compensation we have to get the uh, the livestock stall fed then we'll have to get the dogs uh, you know either neutered or only inside the house no feral dogs because they will transmit lot of disease they will kill cheetah cubs so in fact i would be more worried of the dog than the leopard and so all those are big steps which india has never taken um india has worked in a protected area kind of a situation where we declare an area protected we get people out it becomes sacrosanct for wildlife and then we get our tigers back it is easy with cheetahs it will have to be in public land it will have to be community land it will have to be uh, multiple use areas and that's a different ball game altogether and uh, <laughs> so, but you know anish it's it's really interesting what you say that if we have the vision to actually do some of what you are suggesting open up areas find the land ensure that the uh, the, the cheetahs are secure uh, the the opening up of grasslands uh, with using the cheetah perhaps as inspiration can be a huge step towards enhancing our biodiversity of species which may go extinct isn't that perhaps an even bigger success than just the cheetahs themselves we have to look at it holistically I agree uh, Vishnu Vishnu and when this project was being talked about I have sat through meetings I have seen in my head I first of all I feel we have to uh, take care of the species that are right now extant and we have not done enough for all those species then I told myself okay but now that there is political will for this what is it for a conservationist like me why should I align with this project then this is what i thought of that we are already losing so much we have lost the caracal really caracal is such a charismatic cat but today it's uh, barring a few places in rajasthan in ranthambore which is again a protected area there is nothing there but they live in the same habitat as the cheetah so i started thinking that okay now that the project is going to happen um what can it do so unless and and today what i hear from governments from states that we want to earmark another area which is a gandhi sagar madnor that area in uh, madhya pradesh yes. and some other area but all of those are 500 400 300 square kilometers you cannot stabilize a population even with tigers from and i have studied tigers for last two decades plus you need 20 breeding females in one population for that population to sustain itself over a 100 year period with some amount of poaching and forest degradation so if, so in india you don't have that that's why we conservationists keep talking about corridors where you have fewer than 2 or 20 females here you have fewer than 20 females in another park but if somehow they are connected then it acts as one population because tigers walk a lot with cheetah that could be even um, i mean to get 20 cheetah females in one population you are looking at 3000 square kilometers and does, so does that so, exist in our country anish what are the areas 
in Rajasthan or Gujarat? Do you, so, do you, do you, so there, there are areas, but there are currently there is no area that exists without human beings and people who are already. And Anish, uh, when you when you bring up this point that you know in your professional assessment, it's it's the availability of space, uh, and uh, you know which is uh, which is secure for the cheetah, uh, with a lot of trade-off benefits go down the line. When you when you make this point, what is the answer that you get? So they, so everybody says yeah. I think they, they also want, but I know the great Indian bustard and the forican have gone, not because people went and hunted them down. But in Africa, the same or a relative species, a, a relative of that bustard is surviving in areas which are 20,000 square kilometers big and they survive there. In India, because it's a mosaic of farmlands, which is uh, overrun by dogs, uh, then you have pesticides, then you have a, 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 an area which is protected by the community and a, a, like a grassland under protection. These are all small parcels. You look at uh, Velavadar, which is a very good grass and habitat. It's not even 100 square kilometers. You, you look at any hill habitat. So there what happens is the bustard comes and stays in the safe area for just 50% of the time. Most of the time it is in the farmland. And there there are pesticides, the dogs kill their, uh, they eat their eggs, their chicks. So the same thing is true with cheetahs. And so today there is no habitat like that. However, to say that we will have 4,000 square kilometers, but that will be divided into 10 different parks, cheetahs will not be safe because we will always, it will be like a zoo. For instance, if you are in a zoo and, and, and I'm absolutely against that part where you have a display animal in the open and then you have 10 other animals in the cage, every few days you keep shifting them and that's how people come and see. So it will be a glorified zoo if we have a 500, 600 square kilometers and then you can say that overall we have set aside uh, 4,000 4, square kilometers. No, what we need is 2, 3, 2,000 to 2,500 at least areas which will have people, which will have livestock, but where cheetahs, we have to see how are we going to otherwise stabilize it. It's not going to be protected inside a national park all the time. They are going to go out. So in Kuno, what happened? The cheetah that were released from that bigger enclosure, within no time they were outside. Yes. They walked more than 100 kilometers. They, a cheetah is so accustomed to trotting, it just can walk 20, 30 kilometers in no time. So it's a different ball game. You will keep running after the cheetah with an antenna in your hand and bad luck will always be a few steps ahead of you because... But Arish, you know, let me just ask you one basic question. Are you in principle aligned with Project Cheetah, do you agree with it? See, I am uh, aligned only because I don't see any other way of getting the grassland habitats back in the country. That is the only reason why I am aligned with it because so many species and Cheetah is that iconic species and we know from the success, on the back of the success of the tiger and so many other charismatic species all over the world like the the mountain lion in the uh, in america you have the jaguar same iconic personality the cheetah has and in, luckily cheetah was found in india so i only feel hopeful that bustard we are talking about it but we are not allocating land we are talking about saving 100 square kilometers for the bustard it's not going to work so if cheetah is the last resort is to have an iconic animal and with the help of their iconic animal create these oases for so many other grassland species because we don't know how to manage grasslands we don't know how to manage marshlands we don't because we only are fixed always thinking about the forest so we if we can open up and if we can really uh, you know make our policy makers more scientific because of the cheetah and i'm an optimistic guy and that's the reason i do conservation otherwise i would have also moved away and and because we lose more battles than we win so I think, uh, I, I think we owe it to the grasslands of our country. I think we owe it to ourselves also to get conservation right. The, the benefits of this are, uh, are incalculable. Thank you very much, Anish. Always wonderful to speak to you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Pleasure, Vishnu.